So we're back to the letter to the Hebrews, and uh, it may be that we don't have exactly the same folks who were here last time, so I'll just try and kind of mesh it in so that we can see what we're up to. Well, let me introduce it like this this time. There are, I think there are 21 epistles in the New Testament, 22 if we include the book of Revelation, which was a letter written to seven churches. And all these letters begin in a similar way. They begin by giving us the writer, Paul, Peter, James, John, whoever it was. And then they will that they will give us the um the people that the letter was written to, you know, the church at Corinth or the, the believers here or this, that, or the other. Um 21 of these, and the, then there's one letter which is unique. Because it doesn't have an author, it doesn't have his name to tell you who wrote it, and it doesn't have a destination. And of course, it's this letter to the Hebrews. It's unique. Um, your Bible may call it the, the Epistle of Paul, but that isn't in the original. That's The Bible doesn't give us that information. And it is an amazing book. And I think I said this the last time we were together or the time before that that in the letter to the Romans, Paul uses the picture of a Roman law court, the letter to the Romans, and you've got this way of expressing the gospel in what we call forensic terms and legal terms. So you've got God's accusation that comes against us because of our sin, and then you've got, uh, because of what Christ has done, God is able to declare us right with him so that we are now justified and able to walk from the court a free man. And there are really powerful pictures in the language of Romans. But when you get to Hebrews, you get a completely different scene. And now what you're in, you're in really the scene that has to do with um, temple and cynics, temple worship. Um, and it, it really is very, very powerful. But what was this written for? There's nearly always an occasion behind the writing of these letters. So what's the occasion behind this one? Well, there are five sections in the letter to the Hebrews where the writer kind of focuses in on five great dangers to the people he's writing to. I'll read them. I got my little list here. Um, in Hebrews chapter two, it's the danger of drifting away. In Hebrews chapter three, it's the danger of unbelief. In Hebrews chapter five, it's the danger of not growing up, not maturing. In Hebrews chapter four, it's the danger of willful sin. And in chapter 12, it's the danger of refusing God. So this is the theme all the time. He's writing to people who are in danger of going back on their commitment and reverting to the kind of life that they lived under the old temple Judaism. And there are some very strong warnings in the midst of all this. And uh, let me kind of let me kind of work through parts of it. The Hebrews letter of Hebrews doesn't begin like the other letters with this little greeting. It, it begins quite abruptly, resembling a sermon more than a traditional epistle. And I I wonder uh, whether this, in fact, was a sermon. And if it was, I would have liked to have heard some more of what he had to say. So he begins to describe um, the, the person who this book is all about and uh, he says he emphasizes that in the past God had spoken to the human race through prophets but that in these last days he has spoken to us through his son and then the son is described in different ways he's the one who is the heir of all things he's the creator of the world he is the exact representation of God's being he sustains everything by his powerful word. He has purified our sins, and now he's sitting at the right hand 
of the majesty on high. And the chapter, chapter one, then contrasts Jesus with angels and demonstrates that he was not an angel. There are some um, kind of groups of people who believe Jesus was an angel. Don't, they're not Trinitarians. They don't believe that he was God. They believe he was an angel with a, a unique um, calling. But that doesn't fit into this at all. He contrasts Jesus with angels, demonstrating that Jesus is greater than the angels, saying that, you know, at one point God had said, let all the angels of God worship him. Well, if all the angels of God are to worship him, it's quite clear that the one that they're worshipping is not an angel, because otherwise he'd be amongst the worshippers. So those kind of theories don't work at all. But he goes through various Old Testament scriptures. And if you don't know the Old Testament very well, a lot of this will be really quite mystifying. But I'm hoping if we go through not too quickly, we can begin to build up and see this picture of temple Judaism. We, If you know Jews today, they are probably Orthodox Jews, or they could be liberal Jews, or they could be um, all kinds of things. And, and some, I was with someone just a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking, and I said, I said, I think you're a Jewish agnostic, because she claims to be a Jew, and she's very proud of her Jewishness, but she said, I don't know whether there's a God, and I don't think it matters. So we had, we had quite a conversation. But in the Old Testament, of course, God said to the people when he brought them out of Egypt, I want you to gather together gold and silver and precious stones and uh, different colors of um, cloth and all the rest of it. And I want you to make me a sanctuary, a holy place, because I want to live among you. And then the idea of God living among them brought in the need for, if you like, the camp where God and his people were camped together, to be kept clean and pure. And you get this idea of kind of a need for, for things to be kept clean for God. Uh, and you have the sacrifices and you have cleansing. So you have these pictures of sacrifice, which of course aren't, of course aren't part of the law court background. And you get the pictures of the need for cleansing. And that isn't part of the law court background. The, the judge is never going to, offer you cleansing and, and it, it, that it's a different picture and in the days of jesus's ministry upon earth well it was what they call temple judaism what we have now is really what's known as rabbinic judaism it doesn't it, it, it really in some ways it hardly needs the first five books of the bible because it it, it spiritualizes them and uh, but it doesn't use them um, in the way that God intended them to begin with. And at the end, beginning, at the getting towards the end of his ministry, the warnings of Jesus to the people of Israel that they're about to lose their temple um, become stronger and stronger. He uses parables, stories with an inner meaning, and he makes his warnings even more clear. And perhaps the strongest warning of all was given just a short time before his arrest and crucifixion. And uh, you can see the, the mood kind of developing. Um, if you've, I've got my notes in front of me here or my verses. And uh, this is Luke chapter 19 and verse 41 and 42. And he's coming to the city of Jerusalem. And it says, now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. And his warnings become stronger and stronger. And in the next chapter, in Luke chapter 20, he begins to tell the people a parable. And he starts off by saying, a certain man planted a vineyard, and leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country for a long time. Often, Jesus started a parable with a certain man did this or 
This is this is the cue that this is a story with a story inside it. So this is his story. A certain man planted a vineyard and leased it to vine dressers. This is a key part of this story, that these people who are, vi are keeping the vines, who, who are growing the vines and are taking the vines from them and pressing out the grapes, grapes. <laughs> these people do not own this, where, this um, vineyard. The vineyard is owned by somebody else who's planted it and prepared it, and then he's leased it to the vine dressers, and he went into a far country for a long time. And you know this story. It goes on, the parable goes on to say that um, when the time for fruit came, the man who owns the vineyard sends looking for his fee, for his rent, for the vineyard that he has leased out to them. Um, and they respond in increasing kind of anger with the people that he keeps singing, uh, sending. Um, they rebuke him, they send them away, then they begin to kind of throw stones at him. And then finally, this owner of the vineyard sends to the people who are leasing the vineyard his own son, his heir. And he says, maybe they'll listen to him. But you know what happened. When the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over and they said, this is the heir, they said. Let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. This parable illustrates Jesus as the rightful heir sent by God, but rejected and killed by the people. Several times in the Old Testament, many times, the land of Israel is described by God as my land. It never was Israel's land in an absolute sense. Israel was the tenant farmer. And the tenancy agreement was that they kept the law given to them at Sinai in the time of Moses. So the people who uh, were there, uh, this is the heir that has come, and he. this is their last opportunity, really. He comes looking for fruit. And in Matthew 23, which is round about this same time, you have these amazing words where, chapter 23 and verse 37, it says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. If you put those two kind of statements together, how often I wanted to and you were not willing. He was willing, he was always willing, but they were not willing. And if you remember Stephen, uh, uh, when he was being stoned, um, he um, rehearsed Israel's history. And he summed it up by saying, you always, you're stiff-necked, you always kind of reject the word of God to you. And this is the same kind of theme that's coming through here, that, that these are the last warnings, really, that Jesus is giving to the people of Israel. Um, and he says, it goes on to say, after he said, you are not willing, he says, see, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So he warns them solemnly about the judgment that's coming upon Jerusalem. He warns them solemnly that they're in danger of putting the heir to death and reaping the consequences of that. Um, and then this really kind of terrible statement your house is left to you desolate. They said, let's kill him, and then the inheritance will be ours. Now Jesus says effectively, you can have the inheritance. Your house is left to you desolate. But I say to you that you will see me no more 
till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And here, to the people who would have heard some of those things that Jesus said, no doubt, in the letter to the Hebrews, the writer in Hebrews chapter 1, he describes Jesus as the heir of all things. He says, in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. So this is the heir. Here the Son is shown to be the divine heir appointed by God to inherit all things and to hold a superior position above all, including angels. And the link, of course, between these passages in the Gospels and this beginning of Hebrews is this depiction of Jesus as the heir, emphasizing his divine authority and the fulfillment of God's plan through him. It does, to me, it sounds more like a sermon than an apostle. Just, just listen how abruptly it begins. I'll read a few verses of Hebrews chapter 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Or to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. This word begotten, I, the, the picture here is, is not so much of, um, it's not so much of kind of birth or um, a kind of just the way that babies come into the world. This idea of the firstborn, this idea of the son is a key picture of authority and responsibility. The father chooses the firstborn son as the one who will carry on the family, who, when the father's not there, will take up the responsibility, will care for the family. He will have a double portion so that he can care for any of his sisters or his widowed mother. And it's this amazing picture, at, and I think it's in Colossians, that it speaks of Jesus as being the firstborn over creation. It doesn't mean he is part of the creation. It just simply means that this creation, which was created by him and for him as a result of his death and resurrection, is sitting at the right, Father's right hand. The Father has made him. He's brought him into this place of air where all power is given to him in heaven and in earth. It's a really powerful picture. Um, and for the people, maybe even people in Jerusalem who heard Jesus tell the story about the heir that was put to death and the consequences of it, maybe this story, picking out the theme of Jesus being the heir, uh, would have provoked them, maybe spoken to their conscience. Let me say a little bit about um, the Sinai Covenant. I, I say this constantly, and I say it constantly because for me, the covenants of the scriptures are what my, they call uh, my kind of, um, they are my model. They are the, the, the lens through which I see so much of what the Bible is telling us. This fact of cousin and and these two covenants which are set in the new testament always in contrast to one another they're always not a progression but a definite contrast from one to the other so um what about that sinai covenant what was its nature what was its purpose well i'm going to say three things about it um first of all it was 
from the very beginning, from the day that they entered into covenant with God at Sinai, from the very first day, it was intended to be provisional. That's to say, it was not a final solution to the needs of men's heart. It was not designed to be. It was provisional. And I think there's a verse in Matthew chapter 19, which we do well to keep in mind when we think about the Ten Commandments and all that law. God gave it to them because he loved them. There went forth from his right hand a, a fiery law. Yea, he loved the people. But if you know the book of Deuteronomy, where they rehearse the commandments again before they go into the promised land, you'll know that there are more curses threatened in that book than there are promises made. And it was provisional. And Jesus explained it like this on one occasion when he was talking to people about divorce and remarriage and what the conditions were for uh, divorce and remarriage. This is Matthew 19 and verse 8. And he says to them, they said to him, well, you know, Moses permitted us to um, divorce our spouses. Um, and he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was no so, not so. I think this is a really important verse to take with us when we're trying to understand some of the ins and outs of the law in the Old Testament, because there are some which are complicated and some which don't seem very fair at all, some which seem to be misogynistic, um, some which just don't seem to be the way we would expect God to behave towards his people. And one of the clues to it is this here. It was given because of the hardness of their hearts. The covenants were given to a certain degree as damage limitation. They were given because the people were hard-hearted um, and God introduced these um, instructions and these prohibitions to keep them in check. And in another thing that comes out very plainly through the scriptures um, is that this tenancy agreement was a fixed lease with conditions. Uh, this is the kind of the background to it. It was never intended to be forever. It, it, it was a tenancy agreement with a fixed lease. And uh, this is... Um, this now I'm going to not read now is from Galatians. I don't think that sounds very well, good. I understand me. Um, no, someone, I someone is unmuted. Can you join me? What? What? This is this is Galatians chapter three and verse ten. What purpose then does the law serve? This is Paul writing to the Galatians. It was added. Because of transgressions, now listen to this, until the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the word of a mediator. So Paul asks this question as he's speaking to the Galatians, who had been taught by people who had followed Paul up, that if they really wanted to become full, mature people of God, they had to become Jews. They had to be circumcised. They had to keep the food laws. And that's what Galatians is all about. And Paul asks the purpose and he explains things. And then he says, in that, you can imagine the people saying, well, if that's the case, why did God give the laws in the first place? What's the purpose of it? And he says categorically, it was added because of transgressions until the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a media. So it was, it was a tenancy agreement for a fixed lease. It was never intended to be anything other than provisional. Okay, let me read you a little bit of Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Now to Abraham... And his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, 
as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. Remember that, the seed is Christ. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, later than what? Later than the promises that God gave to Abraham. Verse 17, this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ or to Christ, that it should be made of no effect. And when you look at this, you think, what's, what is he saying here? Well, he's saying that the, the covenant that God entered into with Abraham as a result of, if you remember, the sacrificed animals and Abraham being asleep while the covenant was enacted and there came from each end of this avenue of death um, two symbols, one of a smoking flax and the other um, of uh, an oven, smoking oven. And in other words, in his sleep, Abraham is witnessing a covenant being made. And this is an amazing mystery because Paul says here that that covenant that Abraham witnessed was made by God to Christ. The two people, I'm, I'm not going to kind of try and prove every part of this. I'm just going to declare it. The two partners in the covenant that came from opposite ends of that valley of death and were to meet in the middle. This was the way they used to do make covenants in ancient times are symbols of the father and the son who ultimately will go together to a place of sacrifice to bring in a new covenant so that the father is not imposing anything upon an unwilling son, but the two go together. And that covenant that is then said, that that's the day that God made a covenant with Abraham. Um, and if you look at it, you'll find that the covenant is made with Abraham, but it actually it's all about Abraham's seed, his son. And here, Galatians, in Galatians, Paul says that covenant was confirmed before by God in Christ. So I'll read verse 17 again. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later than that event, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God to Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. But if the inheritance is of the law, can you see we've come back to this word of inheritance? There is an inheritance here. If that inheritance is going to become yours by the law, by the law keeping, it's no longer a promise. You, you will have earned it. If you can say, well, I've done this, 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 and this, then it isn't grace. It's just God paying his debts because he's made a deal with you and you've done what he wanted you to do. What purpose then does the law serve? It says, Paul, it was added because of transgressions, listen, till the seed shum should come to whom the promise was made. In that mysterious event um, that, that Abraham witnessed in his deep sleep, that word deep sleep is the same kind of deep sleep that Adam experienced when God brought forth the, the the wife from um, the rib that he'd taken from Adam's side. This is a deep kind of trance kind of thing. And Mo, uh, Abraham is taking is, is, is playing no part in the middle, in the making of this covenant. He is absolutely fast asleep, but in his dream state, he is witnessing the making of a covenant, which is actually between the father and the son. And it comes with a promise. Verse 19, what purpose then does the law serve, says Paul? That's his question. What's the point of the promise? It was added because of transgressions until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. This is why I say that the old covenant was provisional and it was a tenancy agreement for with a fixed lease. 
It was added because of transgressions. It was added that sin might become exceeding sinful, that sin might, if you like, become measurable, um, that people would have their own consciousness of their own failure to be and to do what God wanted them to be and do. So it was added until the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. So, actually, there are three covenants that are referred to in Galatians. And I think if we kind of separate them out a bit, it will help us to see why the um, these three covenants are really important to understand what each covenant signifies. So, first of all, you have the Abrahamic covenant, a covenant confirmed before by God to Christ. We've just read it, 3 verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was formed before by God to Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it's no longer a promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. So there's the, there's, there's the Abrahamic covenant. I'm not going to call it the first covenant, because that will confuse us. Just let's call it the Abrahamic covenant. In Galatians, here comes another covenant. This is the Sinai covenant. Um, and there's that kind of 319 that we've just read. Uh, and he says it, it, it came and it was appointed through angel by the hand of a mediator. Then a little bit later on in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 22, we have this. It says, and it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the handmaid and one by the free woman. Howbeit, the son by the handmaid is born according to the flesh, but the son by the free woman is born through promise, which things contain an allegory. This is it. This is, this is Paul looking back to the Old Testament stories and interpreting them. They were patterns, types, shadows, silhouettes, templates, and now, with the light of the new covenant, he's beginning to explain what these things signify. So I'll read it again, chapter 4, verse 22. It's written that Abraham had two sons, one by the handmaid and one by the free woman. Albeit the son by the handmaid is born according to the flesh, but the son of the free woman is born through promise, which things contain an allegory. For these women are two covenants. Okay, so this is this is not to do with the site. This this is nothing to do with the Abrahamic covenant. This is a picture of two covenants. So the Sinai covenant is going to call the first covenant. Okay, um, he says here, uh, which things contain an allegory. For well, these women are two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, bearing children unto bondage, which is Hagar. And then in verse 25, he says this astonishing thing. He says this Hagar, the slave woman, is Mount Sinai and corresponds to the Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her sons. He says this Sinai covenant, which later on in Galatians, he'll call the first covenant. This, this first covenant um, that took place at Sinai is pictured with Hagar, who is a slave. Now, the thing is, in ancient law, this was true in Israel and in the other countries as well, that if the mother was free, the children were free. If the mother was a slave, then any children that were born to her, even if they were born by the father who owned the slave, they were actually still slaves. 
So this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. This is an astonishing thing for a rabbi to be saying here, that the Sinai covenant was a covenant that really is typified by slaves. It's a, it's a bondage covenant. It's, it, it leads to bondage. And then he'll begin to speak about another covenant, which I'm going to call the Calvary covenant, which he will call the second covenant. But remember, he's not talking about Abraham's covenant now. He's contrasting the Sinai covenant when the people became God's people and the Calvary, the Calvary covenant. So he's chapter 4 of Galatians and verse 26 when it says this, but the Jerusalem above is free, who is the mother of us all. For it is written, and this is a quotation from Isaiah 54. Now, Isaiah 53, I think perhaps most of the folks I'm speaking to, will be familiar with Isaiah 53, because this is, this is the chapter, perhaps more clearly than any other in the Old Testament, which gives us a prophecy that has to do with the crucifixion of Christ and, and the purpose of the crucifixion, uh, that he, um, all we like sheep have gone astray, but he has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. It's that, um, that's what was happening then in, in, uh, in 53. So you have the suffering of Calvary, in 53 and then in chapter 54 you come to some prophecies well let me read them this four chapter four and verse 27 of galatians chapter four rejoice o baron he's quoting isaiah 54 verses one and two rejoice o baron you who do not bear break forth and shout you who are not in labor the desolate has more children than she who has a husband. At the end of chapter 53, it had said, who will declare his generation as though he has no children as a result of all his suffering. But now we've come into Isaiah 54. This is a chapter about the church. Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who do not labor. For the desolate has more children than she who has a blessing. And then he says this in verse 28. Now we, brethren, this is Paul speaking to these Galatians who have received the Spirit. Remember he said to them at one point, when you receive the Spirit, was that as a result of keeping the law or by the word of faith, by the believing of faith? So these are genuine believers, gifted of the Spirit, and now he says, we, brethren, that's me and you together, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Paul is saying that this antagonism between the, the, the covenant which is represented by Hagar and Ishmael and the covenant that's represented, the Calvary covenant, it, it is a result of these things. And he says this, We brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Spirit say? Listen to this. Cast out the bondwoman. Now, remember he said earlier that Hagar, the bondwoman, um, is in bondage with her children and that she, in the allegory, the, she's the woman from Mount Sinai who bears children unto bondage, which is Hagar. So this is Paul saying that the law brings bondage. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. This is really radical stuff. 
This is this is Paul illustrating very, very powerfully that the new covenant is what do they call them? It's a paradigm shift. It's a complete change from the old. It's not a progression from the old. He takes away the old that he may establish the second. And the writer to the Hebrews is writing from the position of someone who is in the new covenant. And you, you know there's probably more about the new covenant in Hebrews than there is in any other book in the Bible. Um, so if we were to go then from Hebrews chapter 1 and go into Hebrews chapter 2, it tells us why you've had this lengthy introduction. The whole of chapter 1 is showing who Jesus is and how he has by himself purged our sins and sat down at the Father's right hand, and that he, the Father has crowned him, he's anointed him with the oil of gladness above his fellows, um, but he is the one who's sitting in the throne, that he is the one that God has established as his son, the one who will reign, to whom has been given the inheritance and everything like this. This is all in chapter 1. Now, why is he going on and saying all this? Well, look at chapter 2, because this is why he's doing it. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1 says this, Therefore, I know this is corny, but ever, whenever you see the word therefore in the scriptures, ask yourself, what is it there for? What is it saying? It's just, this is telling you that everything he's just said in chapter one is for a reason. And the reason is this. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. There is danger here. And I'm so glad. I think this is such a gracious thing. Whoever this was who wrote this, he doesn't say this is the trouble with you. He says, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. This is a metaphor uh, that's used in the, when it speaks of things drifting away and some other versions may have it in different ways i've got a little list here of things that i was doing when i was thinking about this um darby's translation you know the man who was one of the leaders of the brethren um he says uh for this reason we should give heed more abundantly to the things that we have heard lest in any way we should slip away oh there's a version which says this is the reason there is more need for us to give attendance to the things which we have come to our ears, lest by chance we may be slipping away. Can you see that that picture of drifting and slipping? It's a picture of maybe a, a, a boat, a, a sailing ship coming into harbour, or a boat coming up to tie up by a jetty in a river or something like that. And the picture is that when it gets there, of course, it's tied up. And you'll know later on in the book of Hebrews, there's another image where it talks about um, an anchor that goes into the veil, which makes things absolutely solid. But here he's just simply saying, well, um, we must give, we must. This is one of these absolute imperatives. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard lest we drift away. Uh, because of this, it behoves us more abundantly to take heed to the things that we've heard, lest we may slip away. What do you have to do to slip away? What do you have to do to cause this slippage? Actually, nothing at all. If, you, if you, you, you tie your knot and you don't attend to it, if you don't pay heed to what you're doing, then the agitation of the winds or the currents of the river will slowly loosen, loosen the ties that you made and gradually the boat will slip away and slip away until it goes over a, I don't know, a waterfall or something like this. 
So the metaphor is of being swept along past the sure anchorage, which is within reach. And it's a vivid picture of peril for all we. I said to you that there are five really sober, solemn warnings in the book of Hebrews. And here's the first one. And the first one is that if we don't pay attention to the things that we have heard. Now, brothers and sisters, we have a God who delights to speak to us, who delights to reveal his will to us if we will give him chance to speak to us. If we will give him the opportunity, he will find the way of speaking into our lives. And as he speaks into our lives, we don't live our life according to that mosaic law from um, from Sinai, but we live in a different way. You remember Jesus was asked which is the first and the great commandment, and he reduced the Ten Commandments. I think there are over 600 commandments, actually, in, in, the, in the books of the Pentateuch. But if we just go for the 20, he reduced it to two in the sense that he said, well, it's all about love. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength, and your mind. And the second is like it, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. And when Paul writes to the Galatians, uh, he says that the, the whole law is summed up in this one thing, in this one word. And then he says, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But actually, the Greek word for love at that point is one word. Thou shalt love is one word. So the whole of the commandments that were given to Moses at Sinai um, are now restated, reinterpreted as thou shalt love. And if we were studying Galatians, we then come into the fact, fact that, that we are, we, if we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So we're not endeavoring to keep the laws in order to tick off boxes and say, yes, I've scored eight out of 10 today. <clears throat> but we are fulfilling the implications of the commandment, the truth that's behind the commandment, simply by walking in the spirit. So here's this metaphor. So in chapter two and verse two, he reminds them of how God has spoken to them. And he says, for if the word spoken through angels who have steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? What he's saying here is that you know that if someone sinned under the old covenant, um, if it was a particular kind of a sin, that if there are two witnesses and the case was judged, the person could be put to death. And he's saying here, every transgression and disobedient received a just reward. If that's so, under that old covenant, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the foot, and this is all about the great salvation in Hebrews, as you know. This is the so great salvation of Hebrews, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. And then because he's spoken about angels in chapter 1, he goes on to say, For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. And then he quotes, from the Psalms. But one has testified in a certain place saying, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, don't presume that he's talking only about Adam here. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. 
But now we do not yet see all things put into him. But, and here it is, verse 9 of chapter 2. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honour, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for every man. Later on, he'll talk about these people who are in danger of slipping backwards and losing everything that God has done for them. And he says to them at one point that if they draw back, God takes no pleasure in those that draw back. And when he's describing them at one point, he says, well, they're, they, they've, they've tasted of the powers of an age to come. When the Bible uses the picture of tasting, it's not sampling, it's not giving something a lick to see if you like it and you can come back to it if you do. It's actually Jesus tasted death for every man and he didn't sample it. He drained it to its bottom, its last dregs. So what you have here is um, these people had experienced God in reality, but they're in great danger of slipping away. And here he speaks of this. It, the, this is an amazing passage of Scripture. Um, let me see if I can sum it up for you. Um, I, I use artificial intelligence to look at the second chapter of Hebrews and, um, and do a synopsis on this. Does that embarrass you? Does that worry you? I, I then check it to make sure I'm comfortable with it. But listen to what chapters 1 and 2 are about. The second chapter of Hebrews warns believers to pay careful attention to what they have heard to avoid drifting away from the truth. The author stresses the importance of the message delivered by Jesus, which was confirmed by those who heard him and by God through signs and wonders and various miracles. And the chapter goes on to explain that although humans are currently lower than the angels, everything has been subjected to them through Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little time to suffer death for everyone. Jesus, through his broad covering, suffering, has brought many to glory and is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. It's, it's an amazing statement, all this is. Um, but I'm going to end just with this simple thing, which is when he's spoken about God's original intention for mankind, and you remember that this was God's initial plan, he said, let us make man in our likeness and in our image. And here in this Psalm of David, he's thinking about man, and he's thinking about the privilege of man. And he says, You've made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honour. And yeah, he's lost his crown, but you crowned him with glory and honour. And you set him over the works of your hands, and you have put all things in subjection at his feet. But in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him, but we see Jesus, when the road is rough and steep, fix your eyes upon Jesus. This is going to be a constant theme through our studies in Hebrews. You'll keep on refocusing on, each, on Jesus. There's all kinds of wonderful truths, but what he's focusing on is our relationship with Jesus Christ, that we hear him, that we respond to him, we obey what he says to us. Otherwise, brothers and sisters, there is this danger that we will slip and slide and lose so much of our inheritance and what God intended for us. There's a story told about William Booth. And he was um, giving some final lectures to some of his young officers who were going out to look after various um, Salvation Army works in different places. And uh, he had these young men in front of him and young women. Um, 
And he opened his final words to them by saying this. He said, it is in the nature of a fire to go out if it's not tended. What we're being told in Hebrews, that there is, there is a likelihood that our poles, that are currents, that affect our lives, that are tides that come in and go out, that affect all kinds of things. And if we don't take heed to what God has said, we face the awful danger that our little boat or our ship or whatever it is will just be caught in the flow and it'll just be taken down river and it'll be lost. Five times, five times, in this epistle, in different pictures, we'll find the writer stressing this important, that we, we need to fix our eyes upon Jesus. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the revelation of your Son we find in these scriptures. We thank you, Lord, for the Creator who upholds all things by the words of his power. We thank you, Lord, for the one who is risen and seated above, far above all power and principalities, and who says that we are seated with him in his throne. Lord, I do pray that as we study these things, we won't just be caught up with the fascination of the wonders of the pictures, the types, and the templates, but that, Lord, we will hear you speaking to us with this solemn but kind warning always that says, listen to me, come to me, follow me. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will refresh you. Take my yoke upon you and learn day by day. Learn of me, and you will find rest for your souls. Thank you, Lord, for your plan and purpose for us, and thank you that this lesson in particular contains this amazing statement that by the result of what you have done, those who keep coming to you, hallelujah, Lord, that we may know an uttermost salvation and be kept safe in it through your provision. Amen, Lord. But we see Jesus made a little lower, made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. But we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. But we see
the grace of God should taste death for every man. But we see Jesus made a little lower, made a little lower than the The suffering of death, but we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor, that He, by the grace of God, should taste. 